and all participants are currently muted. And if you'd like to ask a question or offer a comment, just raise your hand in the reactions fu function. It's at the bottom of your screen and you should see um, a button called reactions. If you, if you click on it, then there's a hand raise function within, within that dropdown. And then the other way that you can ask a question is through the chat function. So go ahead and type your chat and Jasmine will read it out and we'll try to get your question answered. So the purpose of the workshop tonight is primarily to learn about the green building related cap measures that um, the city has and then um, gain an understanding of the process for ordinance development, how we're going to transition those measures in our cap to actual ordinances that would be part of our municipal code. And then we'd like to receive public input. And then lastly, we'd like to select a stakeholder, stakeholder committee representatives from each of the different categories that, that we've identified. And here's our agenda. We'll start with a welcome and an overview, which I'm kind of in the middle of right now. And then we'll go over the CAP ordinances in more detail. And then we'll, we'll break out into smaller groups. And in those smaller groups is where we'll be able to talk more interactively. Since this is a large group, we've got about 50 or so people who've joined tonight. So we'll break out into smaller groups. You'll be able to um, share who you are and um, ask. Um, there's some question prompts that we have, we've ha we have, which will hopefully prompt a discussion amongst the subgroups. And then at the end of that breakout session, we'll ask the participants to select the, their stakeholder or committee representative from within um, that broken out group. And then we'll all come back and we'll have a report out and a discussion from the breakout groups, and then we'll wrap up. So let's start diving in. These are all the building related cap measures that we have in our climate action plan and there's eight of them. A few of them we've already adopted, a few of them we've, we've been working on uh, but haven't been adopted by council and a couple of them are new. So I'll go over each one. Um, the first one, BE, which stands for building efficiency, that one's related to residential energy efficiency, and this would be um, applicable to retrofit, so existing buildings that want to come in and do a retrofit or a remodel. And this portion of the ordinance has been drafted, um, although it has kind of been on the back burner since this, um, this measure needed to be updated in the latest climate action plan. So now that it's been updated, we were able to share this draft language and that's actually within the ordinance that is, that is on our page that I referred you to. Um, so that um, is um, something new that no one has seen yet and something that we very much would like to receive input on, both um, maybe not so much in detail during this workshop since we're trying to give an overview of everything, but at some point down the road, um, either during the stakeholder groups, for certainly, and then we'll have um, some additional public workshops where we'll, and a public review period where we'll want to receive um, your input on that drafted language. And then BE2 is residential decarbonization, or decarbonization is kind of synonymous with electrification. And this would be for new residential buildings, and this is a brand new cap measure, so we haven't developed any draft language for the ordinance yet. And then BE3 is for commercial energy efficiency measures, and this would apply to new and retrofit. And um, this, we have developed a language that was reviewed by the public last spring. So if you were kind of around for that, those discussions or um, at that time, kind of right around when the, the uh, pandemic started, we had kind of been in the process of getting those completed and then put those on hold. But now that we've got our cap updated and, uh, and we're kind of ready to go with all of the measures, we're deciding, we're kind of folding in the effort kind of anew and getting all of these done um, and ready to go to council all at once. The next one is BE4, that's commercial decarbonization, again, or uh, IE electrification. 
And this again would be for new buildings, new commercial buildings, and this is a new ordinance. So no, no language has been developed yet. And then RE2, RE stands for renewable energy. That, and this is for residential solar PV systems. This is a measure that has been put into an ordinance and has been adopted by council. This ordinance for us is actually synonymous with the state solar mandate for, for new residential buildings. And so um, that's kind of how we adopted it in our city. And then RE3 is for commercial solar PV systems. And this would be for new and retrofit. And for this one, again, um, it was part of that effort we did last spring where we did draft um, some draft language for an ordinance and it was reviewed by the public um, at, back at that time. Um, the last two, CET4 and CET5, are related to EV charging for residential and commercial. For residential, it would just be new residential, and then for commercial, it's new and retrofit. And both of these have been adopted and have been in place since last, last January. So it's they've been in place for about a year. Okay, so moving on, this is the the process that we'll be following to um, get these ordinances developed and take them to council for approval. So we're right up here at, at number one. We're, at, we're in the middle of this public workshop right now. And uh, once uh, this workshop is over, the goal is to have that stakeholder committee selected. And then um, soon after we'll have a couple of stakeholder meetings where we'll really dive into the ordinances and we'll, we'll, we'll probably focus mainly on those ordinances that have yet to be developed, so the electrification ones, and really work with the stakeholder group to develop some draft language that uh, we can hopefully come to consensus on and then build a draft ordinance around that language. Additionally, that stakeholder group will take a look at the existing draft language we have for the other measures and provide input and feedback on those as well. So eventually the goal is to have a draft ordinance that includes all of the cap measures that we can then take to a second workshop where we bring the full public back at, for review of that draft language and comment. That will also open up the comment period and, uh, and then we will refine the the draft language based on comments we receive. And then with that final draft, we'll take it to Environmental Commission for recommendation to go to council. And if, if Environmental Commission supports it and recommends to go to council, we will take it to council and hopefully get it approved. And as you see on the right here, our goal is really to, we're in February now, and our goal is to try to get to council by June before they go on their summer recess. So I wanted to dive into the stakeholder committee just a, a little bit more and just share the structure that um, we are planning. So the representatives to be selected tonight, um, that'll be during the breakout sessions, and we have these five groups that we've identified would kind of hopefully best represent um, all of the different interest groups um, in this process. So we've got um, a resident group, a business owner group, an environmental advocate group, developer group, and then an at-large group for that kind of undefined area that you always seem to have. And then additionally, um, like I mentioned, there will be an environmental commissioner that was selected on February 11th. That's um, Christian Adams, and he'll be participating in the stakeholder group as well. And the stakeholder committee will have two to three meetings. Uh, we're hoping just two, but it, we might need to expand it to three depending on how, um, on how things go. And again, the two goals there, which I already mentioned, is to discuss and develop the draft ordinance language for building electrification, and then review the existing uh, already drafted language and provide um, input and feedback for that language as well. So questions at this point. Um, Jasmine, hopefully you can help me with, with um, if anyone has their hand raised, you can unmute them, or if there's questions in the, in the chat, if you could uh, ask those, that would be great. There are no questions in the chat. Um, one moment. We have two raised hands. Uh, 
Um, Gary, I'll unmute you, and then if you'd like to ask your question. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. I uh, am wondering <laughs> if, uh, if it matters if a person is a, a Encinitas resident or a business person. Um, you know, I don't, uh, I would prefer that. I guess I'll leave it up to, we'd really like, uh, you know, the, your peers to be selecting your representatives in your breakout room. So I would say in your breakout room that that's a decision that you as, as, um, as participants can, can decide. Um, if there's a, a compelling reason why someone who's not a resident or a business owner should participate, you know, we do have some and, um, environmental advocacy groups who are, who are very active regionally, and I wouldn't necessarily want to preclude them if there was a strong interest to have that person represent um, your particular group. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, yes. And anyone else? Okay, great. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, we yeah. also have, um, I'm going to mispronounce your name, I'm sorry, Dadla? Yeah, hi. Thank I you for that. having me. This is great. Um, I'm just really curious, how will we or they or who is five people? I'm sorry, I missed part of your question. Can you repeat it? Sure. I'm, I'm just really curious on what basis and who, how, how are we going to pick these five people amongst the people here who probably all want to be it. I'm just wondering about the process. Like there was no, you know, application or anything. So what's the criteria for picking them? Yeah. Um, well, there we did, we kept it pretty open-ended. You're right. There was not a formal application. Our hope is that this, um, that, you know, it's, it's not too extensive of a process, but we'll just help staff get kind of more of a window on a little more detail. So when you go into your breakout rooms, you'll be part of that group with your with the other participants that are had self-selected them as that interest group. And really, you know, we'll, there'll be a facilitator in there with you. So they'll help you kind of um, help to make that selection. And I, I know it's gonna be tough because there, there are quite a few interested. So my hope is that with these additional public workshops that, that if you don't get selected for the stakeholder group that these additional public workshops will help to have everyone who's interested in participating also participate. And then of course, at any time, if you have specific comments or questions, you're always welcome to reach out to me and we can be sure to, you know, make sure that whatever level of involvement you'd like, we can receive your input. Okay, thanks, Donla. And then we have one more question from Bonnie. I'll unmute you. Good afternoon, I'm Bonnie Carey. I have a question in regards to how many individuals per group. It was not clear to me. It varies. So um, it, it's a wide range. There's between some of the smaller groups have about five and then the largest group was about 20. So okay. it just depends. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I think I don't see any other hands raised. So I'm gonna move on so we can make sure that we can stick with the agenda timing. And next, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, next up, we have um, Mark Steele, who's going to dive in a little bit deeper to some of the cap measures and give you um, some more detail about the potential requirements that would be involved in each of them. It's doing that thing that I was afraid of. <laughs> Is there a way that you can share it just through your PowerPoint? Try number two. Thanks for your patience, everyone. Any other final questions while we're 
reading. No. Crystal, I just got a question in the chat box. Oh, okay. Um, are public or city buildings slash facilities being examined as part of the energy efficiency standards that we are applying to these residential and commercial properties? That's a really good question. So once it becomes an ordinance, even our our municipal buildings, it would be it would be applicable to those too, because even with our own buildings, we still have to go through the own our our own planning and development review process, just like a, a private building. So the answer would be yes. Any luck, Mark? Ah, here we go. Awesome. Mark, you're muted. There we go. Okay. okay. I'm I'll get this. <laughs> Um, so thanks, Crystal. As mentioned, I'm Mark Steele. I'm with the Energy Policy Initiative Center at the University of San Diego. Um, and so what I'm going to be doing today is providing a brief kind of a high level overview of the ordinances that are being considered by the city of Encinitas um, as you relate to building energy efficiency. So we're, we're not going to focus on the two um, EV charging ordinances um, or the residential PV since those have already been adopted. We're going to focus more on the ones that are already drafted or are in the development stages. Um, and we do have some time for questions at the end, so please feel free to type your questions into the chat box um, as we go along so we can make sure that we capture those. So as Crystal had mentioned, there's, there's really five um, energy-related ordinances or requirements that um, would apply to qualifying existing and or new development within the city. Um, two are specific to residential buildings, and this includes a residential retrofit energy efficiency requirement and a new construction electro electrification requirement. Um, three are then specific to non-residential buildings, and this includes an energy efficiency and solar PV requirement and a electrification requirement. Um, the energy efficiency and solar PV requirements would be for both um, qualifying existing construction as well as new construction, whereas the electrification ordinance would be for new construction only. And then of these ordinances, there's um, some differences in, in where they're at in the development stage. So the residential retrofit energy efficiency ordinance, as well as the first two non-residential ordinances have already been drafted um, by the city and are in review. Whereas the two electrification ordinances, so both the residential and the non-residential requirements for new construction um, are in the development stage and I think the goal of this workshop and some of the stakeholder meetings is to garner some uh, and solicit feedback from interested parties into how those electrification ordinances might look um, for the city of Encinitas. So what I'll do first is kind of provide an overview of those ordinances that have already been drafted and then go a bit more into what an electrification ordinance for residential and non-residential construction might look for Encinitas um, based on other local electrification ordinances that have been adopted or in the process of adoption across the state. Um, so let's go ahead and start with the residential retrofit energy efficiency ordinance. Um, so retrofits of existing single family and multifamily residential units um, may be required to incorporate one or more energy efficiency measure depending on the scope of the project and the home's vintage. Um, these requirements are based on a comprehensive statewide study that examined the energy saving potential and the um, cost effectiveness of certain retrofit requirements. Um, and so for Encinitas is climate zone and utility territory, so climate zone seven and sdg and &E, um, the applicable requirements are what are shown here. Um, 
And this includes attic insulation, duct ceiling, um, cool roof, a water heater package, and lighting requirements. And then more details on the specific requirements um, for each of these can be found on the city's green building ordinances webpage that Crystal had mentioned earlier. Um, it's also linked at the bottom of today's agenda and I'll share it at the end of this presentation as well. Um, so you can access those resources to see what exactly is being required for those qualifying projects. So the second is the non-residential energy efficiency ordinance. And this ordinance applies to all new non-residential, um, certain multi-unit residential, such as high-rise units, and then hotels and motels. Um, in addition, it covers existing non-residential buildings that undergo an addition of a thousand square feet or more, or an alteration with a permit value of at least $200,000. Um, specific requirements of this ordinance cover um, building energy efficiency, renewable energy, elevators, escalators, and other equipment, and then the fourth piece is steel framing. And these requirements are consistent with similar ordinances that have been adopted across the state, um, including just to the north in the city of Carlsbad. So starting with the first piece, uh, the energy efficiency re requirement, um, qualifying projects must comply with the 2019 Cal Green Tier 1 performance standards and use at least one of the measures listed here for applicable components of the project. Um, and again, like I mentioned, further details can be found on the uh, Green Building Ordinances website for the city. For the renewable energy requirement, this has two options available for qualifying projects. Um, the first, this includes on-site renewable energy sources, such as solar PV or participation, um, or the second is participation in a renewable energy portfolio program through a local utility provider um, that provides a minimum of 75% electric power from renewable energy. The third component addresses elevators, escalators, and other equipment. Um, and this really includes controls to reduce energy demand for those um, pieces of equipment. And this includes a, a regenerative drive system and then fan and light controls. And the fourth, the steel framing requirement, um, this requires applicable projects to maximize their energy efficiency to avoid thermal bridging by following the 2019 Cal Green standards, um, which are summarized here on the screen. And again, more detail can be found on the city's Green Building Ordinances website. Um, and we have all this information documented there. So um, I am kind of going through them a little quickly. So if you don't have time to take notes, that's where they're available. Um, so the last of the three developed ordinances is the non-residential solar PV ordinance. So this requirement applies to um, all new non-residential similar to the energy efficiency requirement. And this includes certain multi-unit um, residential such as high-rise units and hotels and motels. Where the thresholds differ for existing buildings, um, that's going to be for um, additions that increase the total roof area by at least a thousand square feet and then for alterations that have a permit value of at least a million dollars that affect at least 75% of the gross floor area. Um, and the required size of the solar PV system um, for qualifying projects can be determined using one of two methods, um, either with gross floor area or using time dependent valuation, um, as you can see here on the screen. So under the first approach, the PV system must be sized at least um, five kilowatts for a gross floor area under 10,000 square feet for all other buildings. So those that are greater than 10,000 square feet, the required PV size must be um, 15 kilowatts per 10,000 square feet. Um, 
for a project that's using the time-dependent valuation, um, here they just must size the system to offset at least 80% of the annual uh, TDV load. So now we'll switch gears just a little bit and discuss some of the potential electrification options for the city of Encinitas. So specific requirements for electrification ordinances that apply to new residential and non-residential construction um, have not yet been identified for Encinitas. Um, however, there are several options that are currently being considered that fall somewhere along the spectrum of electrification. Um, kind of from what you can see here on the screen. And while the spectrum applies to both residential and non-residential requirements, um, just keep in mind that the requirements that the city of Encinitas ultimately decides to go with don't necessarily need to be the same for both residential and non-residential construction. Um, so there could be a difference in requirements for those two building types. So let's walk a little bit through what each of these different categories um, include. Uh, so the first is going to be um, electric preferred or mixed fuel okay um, ordinances. And these requirements allow for mixed use development, um, but they typically require a higher energy design rating or uh, a greater level of energy efficiency in a mixed fuel building, so a building that has both natural gas and electricity, relative to an all electric building, so a building that only has electric um, serving its needs. The second category is the uh, kind of electrify specific appliances category. And these are requirements um, that permit mixed fuel development um, with the exception of certain appliances that are specified within the ordinance. So current local ordinances statewide have typically specified that um, the water heater and or the space heating equipment um, must be electrified with natural gas permitted for other end uses within the home or um, business building. This is followed by an all electric requirement that um, carves out certain exceptions. So it's a little bit of the inverse of the electric uh, specific appliances category. So under this type of ordinance, all new development is required to be all electric, but certain appliances or equipment may be permitted to use natural gas. So current ordinances that fall into this category um, typically permit one or more combination of um, either cooktops, which would be the range or the oven, fireplaces, and usually pool um, or spa equipment. Um, additionally, there are some ordinances that exempt certain occupancy types from the electrification requirements. Um, generally, that would be for non-residential construction, so for emergency facilities or um, research laboratories, those types of facilities where natural gas may be required for operations. And at the far left of the spectrum are going to be um, all electric requirements that do not allow for any um, exemptions for any end use type. Um, however, there are, again may be some ordinances that exempt certain occupancy types um, such as emergency or research facilities where natural gas may be um, imperative to operation. Um, and using this all electric approach includes both all electric reach codes, like a local ordinance or what the city of Encinitas is looking to develop, um, and natural gas bans that have been enacted by a local city. So to better understand how other jurisdictions are requiring electrification, we've identified relevant ordinances statewide and have kind of summarized them here for you. Um, so this current slide shows the number of jurisdictions that have adopted local energy ordinances for single family and low rise multifamily development. 
Um, and we can see that the majority have um, adopted an all electric requirement um, followed by um, electric preferred. And again, a lot of the exceptions that we see here for all electric requirements are going to be mostly for cooktops and fireplaces um, and sometimes pool and spa equipment. Um, the next category is going to be for high rise multifamily residential projects. Um, and again, statewide ordinances are predominantly in the all electric or electric preferred. That's where we see the majority. Um, with the exception here to um, you know, single family and low rise uh, residential, that um, majority of their all electric requirements are in the or no exceptions categories. So no end uses within the home um, are permitted to use natural gas. And then the, the final group that we want to take a look at is going to be non-residential requirements. Um, so again, electric preferred or an all electric requirement are kind of the dominant types of electrification ordinances adopted in the state. Um, and for all electric, we see um, quite a few that come in with the exceptions. And of these 11, all 11 have an exception for for-profit kitchen equipment. Um, so gas ranges and stoves um, and not too many exceptions otherwise. Um, so that was kind of a, a quick run through of the ordinances that are um, being developed by Encinitas with those first three already in um, kind of the draft form and the focus now really being on developing what to include within the electrification ordinances. Um, and again, a lot of this information is available on the city's website. So if there is something that um, you missed that you'd like to go back and take a look at or delve a little bit further into, um, you can access them through the link on the screen um, or the link that I believe was provided in the chat already. Um, and then we do have some time, I believe, still, Crystal, to answer some questions. And um, I have the rest of the team here at Epic with me. Um, so if there's something I might be able to answer, they're, they're here as well. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Mark. And so if you have a question again, just use the raise hand function to raise your hand, or you're welcome to type it in the chat as well. And then Jasmine will call on you when she sees hands raised or read out your question. Dadla, um, I think you're unmuted. You can go ahead. Hi, thanks Mark for going over that. Um, I just wanna um, ask a question about residential, single family home uh, requirements. I'm looking at the um, table one energy efficiency requirements for residential retrofits. Um, am I reading this right? That for um, a, a residential retrofit attic installation is, is not required? Mark, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, it, it's not that it's not required, it's what we're doing here is going a bit above what is currently being required. Um, so it's increasing the requirements for those particular projects. Well, so what does NA mean under the, the column single family retrofits vintage? Is NA, maybe I'm not understanding that. So, so right now, any home that undertakes any of these projects has to abide by state requirements. And what a local energy ordinance does is it goes above and beyond what the state is currently requiring. For attic insulation, what this is saying here is that having an enhanced requirement or an increased requirement that goes above what the state requires, there's not currently an option available for homes of any vintage that would be cost effective. Um, for any local energy ordinance that's being adopted, um, in order for it to be approved by the California Energy Commission, they have to show one of two things. One, that it 
reduces energy, um, and two, that it's cost effective. Um, and what we see with the statewide study is that for these homes, this requirement itself is just not cost effective. And so they can't require anything more than what the state already does require. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Any questions in the chat? I know this is a lot to get through and this is not our first opportunity to, to really dive into it and ask questions. So I definitely understand that. Looks like Greg has a question. Greg, I just unmuted you. Thank you. Uh, this is a pretty simple question. Uh, how, when will these uh, requirements be applied to existing uh, residential buildings? Is it only when someone applies for a building permit? Yeah, that's exactly correct. So that's, that's the authority the city has to make these requirements required <laughs> is when a permit request is made. And so then um, we would take that permit request and compare it to what the current um, Encinitas codes are. And if this is one of the codes that's in place, then it would be, and it's applicable to your project, then it would be required on your project. So it wouldn't be that all of a sudden all homes now have to have to retrofit. It's just when you come in for a permit. And, and that's the only time in, in, in the way this, this is uh, yeah. structured at this point. That's correct, okay. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Let's we'll move on now then to our breakout sessions. Um, so again, we'll be breaking out bro breaking out into those five groups that I mentioned: residential, uh, business owners, uh, environmental advocates. See if I can get them all. Developer and then ad hoc. So most of you, when you, when you registered, you pre-selected what your preference was and a few have not. So I think what's gonna happen is that most of you should automatically be, be put into the breakout room. And if you're not, you'll be left in the main meeting room with Jasmine and she'll help you decide which room that you'd like to go in. And then all of the facilitators, we've already pre-selected who will, um, which group we'll go with. So you'll have a facilitator in each group. And so the goal of the breakout rooms is number one, to, um, to answer a couple, of, we've got a couple of prompt questions and, um, and hopefully we'll be able to have a, um, a good discussion about um, the focus uh, of the breakout rooms is the building electrification. Since that is uh, the part of the ordinance that has not been well developed, we'd really like to get public input at this point, this early stage to kind of steer the direction of where we'll land and on that spectrum of, of requirements. And so we've got a few, few prompt questions. We'd like you all in those breakout rooms to introduce yourselves to your, your cohort. And then um, towards the end, we will ask that um, within your group that you make that final selection for who, who you would like to be to have represent you in the stakeholder committee. And so then once we um, break back out of those um, breakout groups, you'll have one person who will be the spokesperson for your group who will report out and share with, share with the larger group what you all discussed and then also share who your selected representative was. Um, I think that's pretty much it. And your facilitator will help you um, with a little more detail and we'll get to it. And then Jasmine, did you mention that I need help with my selection as well? Is that right? Yeah, I think you'll okay. have to move yourself. But for everyone else, if you are accidentally somehow in the wrong breakout room, exit the breakout room to come back to the... Um, okay, so this is the part of the workshop where we're going to hear how the breakout groups went. Um, we had five breakout groups and uh, let's see, we were going to hear from the residential group first. Is that right, team? That's what we had agreed on. 
So that would be Mark Steele and then whoever Mark Steele had selected to be their reporter. Yeah, it looks like that's Felicia. Um... So I guess, did they put me, did everyone else drop out or is Mark not with us? Mark uh, is here, the, everyone's back in the main room now. So you're okay. with the larger group now and we're, what we're interested in doing now is hearing how your individual work at, breakout room went and maybe sharing one or two kind of highlights from the discussion that you had in your breakout room. Okay. Um, so I guess they, so you guys want me to summarize that? I came in a little bit late, uh, but there was discussion of um, uh, perhaps some sort of uh, performance-based uh, home evaluation in terms of energy, uh, how efficient homes are. That was one bullet point. Uh, another thing that was discussed was the uh, concept of, you know, what is a mandate? How, how, how far can you go with a mandate? How can you balance the mandate of, say, uh, putting a, um, a photovoltaic um, car charger in the uh, you know, in the garage, uh, would that be mandated or, you know, would that be, you know, what works out best there? Um, so let's see, and uh, there was also talk of appliances, uh, uh, alternatives, uh, heat pumps for uh, say water heaters and so forth. And then there was also the discussion of uh, affordability of some of these new technologies. Um, they're great technologies, but are they affordable from a, you know, uh, on a general level? So uh, that's just a quick rundown. Um, Thank you, please Felicia. jump in, anyone else? Thank you so much. That was a good summary. Um, so now we'll hear from the business owner group and Whoever was the selected that speaker like there can. Warren Scott. I believe you selected me to make the, uh, the input. Uh, there was five of us in there uh, with the facility you're included. Uh, interesting that I'm an architect and, and there was another architect, Bart Smith was there. Then we had a Cal Green um, uh, code uh, assist uh, consultant and also a solar energy uh, installer for that. So. We got kind of on that side of the business. I was looking for somewhere that more of a business that actually run businesses here and needed the input. But, yeah. but because architects have been involved with this so much, we actually kind of focused a lot on what, what it takes to get this done. And Cal Green is probably the main thing that we should continue to use as a guide for all this, for this. Mm -hmm. for this. Um, one of the things we had an issue we talked about was that uh, a lot of difficulty with getting permits and processing for permits. And therefore there's a lot of people that are trying to avoid doing some of this work because of the difficulty, how long it takes, um, the approval process. Um, we all agreed that electrification is a good thing. Um, we also see the risk of it, like what we see in Texas. Um, what happens if we're all involved in electrification and suddenly things go out or don't get properly controlled. So um, we're seeing things like getting more battery backups and stuff like that. Um, also, we need education. And one of the big things is a lot of people don't understand what the best direction is for electrification. Um, you know, like uh, stoves, people don't want to use, they all want to use gas stoves because they like the heat. But, you know, the, uh, I personally have an induction stove. I'll never go back to gas again. It's the greatest stove ever. Um, the infrastructure is one of the things we still need to get involved with. We have a lot of projects that can't support the new electrification. So uh, I think that's the best I can do throw there. Okay, thanks, Warren. And next group that we were going to highlight is the developer group. Who is the representative for that group?
So Crystal, uh, it's Rich Williams here. So everybody, everybody pointed at me. So I got <laughs> stuck with this. First, I want to give a shout out to Dodlo, my my energy hero there. Thank you, Don, for, for I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. So um, anyway, and it's great to see a lot of uh, familiar faces here. Um, so. Um, Wow, where to start here? So uh, one of the things that we determined, really, it's difficult um, to do a one-size-fits-all for electrification. First of all, we discussed what, you know, what measures we might implement. But we also see that, in particular, say, for multifamily, um, you're starting to, if you're going all electric, gas is cheap. That's the simple, you know, truth of it. So once you start going all electric, you start getting higher energy bills. So there's practical applications um, as well with um, multifamily. So we're thinking that single family is a really good place to focus on um, electrification. And we're talking about residential now, and then maybe kind of leaving multifamily down the road. Um, things like heat pump water heaters, totally impractical for multifamily. Uh, water heating is a big problem for that. So multifamily is, is tough for a number of reasons, but single family, However, we, we really can go towards electrification um, in, in, in that realm. Um, but storage, um, Warren, you brought that up. I think resiliency is a really important issue for, for all of us. I think that's one of the things that we thought that promoting storage, um, it's our, there already is a degree of promotion in the Title 24, uh, but not like there is the solar PV. So we could do something where uh, we start requiring that. Um, I think everybody would be happy when a power outage comes and they actually did have backup to keep their, their food frozen. Um, so I, 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 you know, we kind of went over all the different things we could do. Um, cooking, um, I'm glad that Warren said that he loves his induction uh, because that's, that's problematic. A lot of people like gas, but being able to do um, <laughs> dual cooking um, type situations where you actually combining cooktops that have both gas uh, and electric uh, induction uh, in those. Um, but, um, and one of the things that uh, was discussed. Um, all this is great, but if you don't have any um, inspector education or any uh, enforcement by inspectors, it's not going to make a difference. Anything that we we're, we're talking about here, we can put it all in there. But builders do whatever they want to do to try, try to get by. And if inspectors don't enforce it, then so what? So I think that's really a a key issue here that we have to address um, in the city is to get our inspectors on board with all this. That's a good that's point. Um, and Rich, I'm sorry I didn't do this with the last group, so I'll go back and ask, but Rich, who did you select in your group to be on the stakeholder committee? Wait a minute. We didn't do that. Oh, you didn't? Mark, oh. Mark, Mark, Mark. <laughs> we didn't give Mark a chance to get to that, I guess. We talked to you about You guys were so engaged in your discussion. Yeah. Okay. Um, shoot. Okay. Well, we'll figure that out separately. For the first two groups that already reported out, uh, for the residential group, if the reporter wouldn't mind um, reporting who the selected representative for the stakeholder group is. Hi, Crystal, it's, it's Mark. Okay. Um, uh, with our group, we, we got a little cut short on time, but we were um, discussing between uh, Felicia, who had reported out for our group, and um, John Giada. Uh, and they're possibly interested in being um, co-representatives, if that's something okay. that's interested in. Okay. Um, well, good. Well, we'll hold that, and I'll, I'll sort it out with those two, um, if it's a co or select one between the two. Thanks, you guys. And then the next one was um, business owners. Is that correct? Warren. Yeah. Can... Are you able to unmute here? I'll unmute you. Okay, so uh, was it you that was the representative, Warren? Uh, I think I was the default one, actually. <laughs> but uh, I will provide that, yes. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Warren. Okay, and so the next group to report out is the Environmental Advocate Group, which was my group. And our representative was, um, our, our um, excuse me, our reporter was Alexandra. So. Hi, um, hello. So um, we chose Peter Davis to be um, a representative on the stakeholder committee. And we basically just kind of briefly as a group went over um, like what 
actions related to the building electrification that we would be willing to take. And a lot of us kind of talked about the importance of education um, and it kind of just kept coming back to that. Um, but switching on our water heaters, um, making a switch to induction cooktops, things of that sort, just easy fixes that we can make, but um, really educating um, on where to make those fixes because um, someone said that, you know, they need guidance on, guidance on where to even begin. So, um, and then some of the barriers we talked about were just having, again, education, knowing that the contractors and the installers know about all of this. Um, and a uh, quote from Carl, no one is in love with their water heater, but they are married to their gas stove. So trying to get people to um, be more willing to convert. Um, and lastly, the benefits of uh, building electrification is um, just no more uh, natural gas um, leaks, or if there's an earthquake, then you don't have to worry about anything like that. Um, no more gas infrastructure. And I think, um, once again, the how we're bringing it about and how we're talking about it can be really important. So selling it more of as a benefit um, and not a mandate. Um, is really important. And lastly, we talked about public health benefits. Yeah. Great, thank you, Alexandra. And then the last group is the the, um, the ad hoc group or the, the at large group. Who is the representative for that group? Hi, um, I'm going to summarize what we talked about. And um, Dennis Cook was chosen to represent our group. Um, and Dadla would very much like to be also involved in this um, because he's such an expert. Um, so, you know, if, if possible, that would be great. We all agreed on that <laughs> too. Um, so we talked about some of the same things that other groups did as well, mostly the, you know, concerns about the vulnerability of the electrical system. Um, and then also the importance of taking a whole building approach. So it, it seems like the, um, the residential group who suggested, you know, to do like a home efficiency analysis, like that kind of thing would be very helpful because, you know, it's not necessarily that helpful to put in a really amazingly efficient system when your house sucks and it's not going to uh, really heat it or something. Um, and so those are the, the two main things. And then also just, um, we talked a bit in the beginning about the fact that, you know, the different types of businesses need to be considered like an agricultural business is very different from, um, you know, a restaurant or something. So maybe the ordinance needs to have some nuance in it based on that. Yeah, good points. Okay. So that's all the report outs. Thank you all so much. I'm glad we got most of the representatives for the stakeholder group selected. And there's a lot of interest. So I really appreciate that. There's a couple who are interested in doing co-representation. So I would potentially be open to exploring that. It would be a bit of a larger group, but um, I would be open to that. And then we've got one group who did not select and we'll sort that out offline. So no worries there. We'll just reach out to you over email and hopefully make a selection that way. Um, so it is 6.37 and now we want to open it up for more of a general um, comment and question opportunity. If there's additional questions, um, now is just kind of an open opportunity to do that. And if you've got a question, I do see two hands raised at the moment. I don't know if those are intentional hand raises for questions. If so, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask is, I see Ross with his hand up and Linda with her hand up. So if, if you do have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. And then Jazz, let's see, we'll wait a moment for that. Okay, I think those may be unintentional, but I do see Dadla now as a with a hand up. Dadla, you want to go ahead? Yeah, thanks, Crystal. Um, I want to I want to use this opportunity to thank this <laughs> incredible group of talented people who are interested in this topic that's very close to my heart. 
and I want to thank Rich for thanking me and I'm very proud of my protege. Um, he's really put this all this theory to work. Um, and my one comment I would like to leave the group with if, if I'm not involved, try to try to do these two things. Use a holistic approach, test before you change things, and remember the loading order, which it sounds a little bit upside down. There's a pyramid of loading order or the order in which you upgrade homes or buildings. And it's at the bottom is the load that you have, how much energy the building takes. You don't start with putting solar panels on a house or clean energy into a house. You start with the load and you think about the envelope and how much energy it takes to heat and cool the building. So hate to see us using clean energy wastefully. You can waste energy clean or dirty. So that's, if, if I don't get to be a part of this, maybe some of the other people will, will follow that guideline. Thank you. Thanks, Tabla. And I still see Ross and Linda's hands up. Do either of you have a comment or a question? <clears throat> okay. And any questions or comments in the chat, Jasmine? We haven't had anything else come in yet. Okay. Well, great. You guys got all your talking out in the breakout sessions. Oh, Tara. Go ahead, Tara. Just curious, I know in our group, some people mentioned that they would be willing to help with information and I wouldn't know how to get in touch with them after this if I wasn't part of um, the, the stakeholder group. So mm -hmm. any suggestions? Yeah, that's a good question. I would be open to certainly to sharing emails, but I don't want to do that without permission. So why don't I, um, I'll work out a way to um, email you all and get your permission to share your emails details and your your contact information and I'd be happy to um, start a, a group list of, of folks you all definitely have some great um, you know expertise here and interest and I would definitely hate to have that go by the wayside so that's a good question um, and I see Noah's hand up <clears throat> Yeah, I just wanted to use the opportunity to just say very quickly um, that uh, I think it's really important to remember, th remember throughout these conversations that natural gas is uh, one of the top sources of, of greenhouse gas emissions in our region, in our cities throughout our region. Um, and as, as we all know, we're, we're, we truly are in a climate emergency. So as we're kind of transitioning off of fossil fuels, it's going to be really important for us to use. Uh, particularly transition off of natural gas and building electrification is a great, really effective strategy to to achieve the, those goals. Um, so I'm I'm really excited that this conversation is happening here, and I'm grateful for the stakeholders who are going to be uh, working it out. So, yeah. Great, thanks, Noah. And I see Rich has his hand up too. So once you've spoken, if you wouldn't mind unraising your hand, that would be helpful for me at least. Thank you. <laughs> so Rich? Okay, so, um, you, you know, I gotta tell you, it, 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 we've got projects right now that are both under the Green Building Incentive Program and not under the Green Building Incentive Program. And there's a huge motivation <laughs> um, for going under the Green Building Incentive Program. Um, right now we're seeing Permit revisions, if we have to do, make a change on a permit, taking three months or more for projects that are not under the Green Building Incentive Program because of the whole thing with the, the CSS portal, we have to do everything online, right. versus 10 days to get approval under the Green Building Incentive Program. We've had projects that have completely stopped for three months or more. Uh, and. <laughs> It's, and Bart, I know he's here. We got a project with him. Uh, he knows about this. It's it's worthwhile. Green building is fantastic. So um, I, I don't know. This 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 program has got enough uh, uh, recognition. So I just wanted to uh, uh, call out to that because we we have this in place at the city. I think it really needs to get a lot more recognition. Yeah, and that's a good point, Rich. And um, it we we should. Um, talk offline. I know that the, the, you're not the only one who has had, 
challenges with wait times. And I know development services is aware of those issues and, and the level of staff they have versus the level of permit applications they're getting. Um, and the green building incentive program is one thing that we are looking at to um, perhaps revamp to offer incentives for, for doing more um, retrofits for homes and um, other buildings. So um, definitely reach, reach out to me and I'd like to hear more about your thoughts on that issue and how it relates to the Green Building Incentive Program. Um, any other, let's see, I see John Gatta's hand up. Sorry, sorry, I had to lower my hand. Um, yeah, so uh, first of all, I, I think, you know, there's several different reasons why this effort is in process, right? Greenhouse gas emissions and climate um, emergency are probably at the top of the list. Uh, there's also, though, um, you know, efficiencies um, in general. And, and then there, for the customer, of course, it's preference and, and, uh, and uh, cost savings, right? So um, if we're going to go forward with, with these kinds of things, I think education of the public, you know, why they're doing this, you know, what their options are, um, how if there is an upfront cost, it may cost less over time. Um, I, I think that's vital, you know. Um, people aren't going to want to give up their gas stoves or, or their gas dryer or their gas oven. Um, but, you know, if they find out if, if they could use a heat pump to heat or, or cool their home and it's super efficient, right? It's, it's more than 100% efficient, right? If that's I know it seems impossible, but um, people might be more more willing. Um, I know that we're talking about different groups of people here. We're talking about multi-building uh, 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 developers here, as well as home uh, owners, residential. Um, but I think absolutely the education to the people is, is, is vitally important. Uh, and then I wanted to just ask real quick about that permit revision, the difference between um, you know, standard or being on the program, what, what is the difference? What, what's the cause for that difference in timeline? Um, what's your, can you explain your question a little more? I'm not understanding. Sure. Uh, I think Rich just was expressing a, that he had two different projects and he made a revision in each oh. and one was three months and one was 10 days. Yeah, so, so he's- So he's, I can, uh, sorry to interrupt there, Crystal. You can explain, Rich. So yeah. the Green Building Incentive Program has two benefits to it. And you either um, register under a LEED um, project or um, under Greenpoint rated uh, project. And um, so the two different certifications there. So you're gaining uh, green certification. Um, and if you are um, in the Green Building Incentive Program, two benefits are, you get expedited permit processing. So what happens uh, is you end up, your, your, your permit application goes to the top of the pile. So once staff gets over their current workload, yours is the very next project that goes, goes on there. And, and when there's a, a ton of work going on with not much staff being able to do it, it's a huge benefit. Or if you're a regular project, you go to the bottom of the pile. So you're waiting for staff to go there. So that's why it's, it's, it, it goes faster. Um, the second benefit to it, um, with the American Reinvestment Act as part of the recession and the stimulus, um, the, um, the city has a whole ton of money sitting there. Um, so you actually get uh, $2,000 uh, back um, when you finish your, um, you get your certificate of occupancy mm -hmm. and you complete your certification, you do that. And then of course you get a city council recognition for that too. I'm sorry, there's a, a third thing. I don't think of that as a benefit because <laughs> you, you gotta go shake hands with the mayor, so. <laughs> Okay. Right, right. And so I think that's a great example. I think that's a great example of providing some incentive as well as, you know, the mandates. And, and I think on the residential side, that could be done as well. Um, and, you know, if there is no necessarily upfront cost savings, you know, maybe going with a, a heat pump gas or clothes dryer, it's going to be more expensive and it may cost more to run. Maybe there's some sort of other incentive like, you know, permit uh, expedition, expedition, Expedi mm -hmm. Wow, expedi expediting? English was my first language, sorry. And, um, and uh, maybe some so, sort of rebates that are tied into the state. Anyway, that's it. 
Thank you. Yeah, that's a good point, John. And I'll just make one comment um, with what Rich was mentioning regarding the Green Building Incentive Program um, and how he's found it to be a benefit. There's actually very few um, permit requests that come in that want to use that program. So um, it's great that Rich that you've found that as a as a, a, a something that you're able to utilize. Um, but it's it's not uh, um, maybe it's not well known or maybe it's not just you know maybe looked at as a ben benefit from others. But um, we tend to have some available funds at the end of each fiscal year in in that uh, account. So that is, like I mentioned, that's an area where we're looking to possibly revamp it to not only provide benefits for getting the certification, which is great because it's more of a well-rounded kind of holistic look at a building, but, you know, if you're, if you may not have the feasibility as maybe an individual homeowner to get the certification, which is part of the requirement, um, it's, it's time consuming and costly. What we want to do is expand it and allow incentives for other smaller things like um, insulation or other energy efficiencies like dual pane windows, things like that, that um, we could incentivize also with that money. Um, so that's something that we're looking at. Um, Jasmine, I wanted to stop at this moment and see if there's any questions in the chat that I'm um, missing. In the chat, but Rich does have his hand raised. Okay. So let's go. Yeah. So, so, sorry to monopolize a lot of conversation here, but there, um, lead, yes, I, I agree. Lead is very difficult. Um, I'm, I'm a lead AP for new construction and, and for homes, so I love the lead program. But we primarily utilize the Greenpoint Rata program. It's okay. a California centric program, it's easy to implement. They actually have both remodels and new construction um, um, pathways for this. It's very easy to implement. Um, and Lynn Mischke's on here uh, as well. Um, she is a Greenpoint Raider. Um, she does a lot of work in, in Encinitas. It's not a difficult thing to do. So I don't think you have to really dumb down the program at all. I think if you create more aware awareness for Greenpoint Rated, um, it would make a big difference because it's, it's, it's really designed for California. Um, it's, it's an easy program to implement. And it's not very expensive. Um, pretty much the incentive that is provided by the city will cover the cost right there. And I invite Linda to actually talk about it if, if, if you wish. Okay, thanks Rich, I appreciate that. And, and um, that's really, um, I think we should talk more offline because like I said, we, we did want to kind of revamp it. And if I could get more of your ideas on how the program has been working from, um, from a developer's perspective, that, that'd be really useful to know. Um, Julie, your hand is up. Yeah. Um, so once the ordinance will be in place, I, um, I'm just wondering, like, how would you make sure that people uh, follow it? Like, I would like to talk about enforcement because, I mean, we know that people do remodel their place without submitting a permit uh, yeah. when they, sh they should submit a permit, and um, and so they will like avoid the new ordinance of the, on the electrification, for instance? So just yeah. enforcement in general. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, like one of the commenters mentioned, it's, it's important, maybe it was in my breakout room or, or might have been here in the larger room, but they mentioned that one important component is to make sure that the building inspectors are aware of the regulations and that when they're doing their building inspections for um, once the construction is happening after the permit is received, um, that they're aware of what the requirements are and that they're ensuring that uh, what was permitted is what's being installed. Um, so that's one part of, yeah. of the enforcement that, that part of my responsibility would be to ensure that not only once we have the ordinances that, we're, that they're on the books, but that um, my our planners and our building permit reviewers and inspectors all know what the rules are and that they're checking for those. Um, but you do have a good point about once the project is built and say they put in a certain type of appliance and really did want the other and after they get, you know, the sign off from the inspector, they change it out. And that that can happen. It's, it's a tough one to kind of tackle because um, it's, it, you know, it, we'd have to have some sort of enforcement 
program that went in afterwards and that's not typically what um, we do. So I'll have to think about that one a little bit more and see um, how we can handle it. And I was pointing out the um, people who do not submit a permit. Well, oh, they right. should, like they remodel without a permit. Yeah, those are tough too. So you um, can have, I mean, if, it, right? if it's something that's, that, because it's, I mean, we're not, the city doesn't go into people's homes to check things like that. I mean, if it becomes a nuisance or a problem, like say sometimes it, it's, it's identified when the home is sold. Um, so that mm -hmm. can happen. That could be a, a point of, of um, correction there or, um, or if it's something that becomes a nuisance for another property owner, say if it were like, I don't know, something to do with gray water or something that's impacting another homeowner that wasn't permitted. I mean, that that's something that we could address. But yeah, that's a that's a tough one that I don't know if I have a good answer for. I'm sorry, Julie. All right. Um, any other Chris, questions? Chris, did one comment come in um, through the chat? Okay. It says, I am still not comfortable switching to all electric because our electricity is not yet sourced from renewable sources here in Encinitas. So electrifying now just leads to more costs and no real benefit climate wise. That is a very relevant question uh, because actually just this week, um, our city council voted to select, uh, so here, let me back up. So, it, um, so we have a new community choice energy program that's gonna be um, coming up and running in the city of Encinitas. It's called San Diego Community Power. And they're gonna take over the responsibility. I saw some claps and hand raises there. Um, they're gonna be taking over the responsibility for purchasing the electricity for our community. And when they do that, um, their one of their goals is to um, provide as much renewable electricity as they can. So right now the base rate that they'll be offering to um, the whole five city community is 50% renewable power. However, just yesterday, our council at City of Encinitas voted to make our base rate 100% renewable. So when San Diego Community Power comes online in our city, which is gonna be a phased approach, it's starting in March for municipal accounts, in June for commercial accounts, and then next, uh, about a year from June in 2022 for residential accounts. And so when everyone comes online to San Diego Community Power, they'll be coming online at that 100% renewable rate. So in just a year's time, everyone will be served with 100% renewable energy, which is really exciting. Um, you can always, as a customer, opt down if you don't prefer that. It's going to be, um, the cost will be comparable to what you would have received um, if your energy was being supplied by SDG&E. So there's, there's not really much of a cost difference for being on Power 100. There will be a little bit of a cost savings if you wanted to opt down to the 50% renewable rate, which is called Power On. Um, so there's some options for customers, but for Encinitas, you'll be opted in at the top rate, and then you can choose from there. So hopefully that answers that question. That's a fun one to answer. Um, any other questions? Okay, well, we are getting close to seven, so this is a perfect time to wrap up. Thank you all very much for participating. I hope you learned a little bit, and we did end up making most of our stakeholder representative selections. I'll follow up with the one group that didn't make theirs, and then the ones that were interested in CO, um, we'll consider that as an option. I think that's something that we could possibly accommodate. Um, and stay tuned for the continuation of this process. So we'll have the stakeholder committee uh, meet a couple times. That'll probably take a month or so to do. And then we'll have, then we'll come back again and offer another public workshop for everyone to kind of rejoin and, and see what got developed in terms of the ordinances. And I think that wraps it up. Any final questions before we close out? Yeah, Crystal, someone asked in the chat, is it recommended to do solar panels along with a battery? Um, it's a, I would say yes, but it, it is a little more costly to have the battery. Um, what you get there is the benefit of, of having your battery, or sorry, your solar charge your battery, and then you can use 
that battery during the time, you use the energy from the battery during the times when the sun is not shining. Um, but those systems are more costly, so that's something to consider as well. And Scott, I see your hand raised, so why don't you close that with the last question? Yeah, I, I would just uh, respectfully request and apologize that I was I was a bit late. But uh, whoever is the uh, stakeholder for the developers, um, I would I would like to get in contact with them just to give them my perspective on uh, electrification and and natural gas use from a commercial property perspective. Okay, and you know what? That's actually the group that um, did not make their selection. So I will email all of you together to coordinate that. Um, that selection. And Mark, you have your hand raised up. Mark Deline, you want to? Yeah, I've been trying to chat to you to tell you that William oh, Morrison did volunteer. William Morrison did volunteer to be the developer stakeholder. Okay. So we do have somebody. Thank you. Oh, okay. William Morrison. Thank you. So Scott, I will connect you with William Morrison and you, and you can um, share your ideas with him. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you everyone. I am going to wrap up the workshop and hopefully see you at the next one. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you, Crystal. Yep. Crystal. You're welcome. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal.